Once again today we come to your place of listening out there in the radio listening audience. Appreciate you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church. This is Preacher Edward speaking from the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Have quite a few of our members out today with the flu and colds. Probably a lot out of other churches out likewise and I hope the good hour coming up be a blessing to all of those as providentially hindered from being in God's house today because of illness. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, you in the radio listen audience, if you tune in to this station where you're now listening each day at 12 o'clock noon, you can get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday. I appreciate it if you do that, covet your prayers, like for you to write to me. Now, the message today will be on tape number 320. Tape number 320. I'm going to bring a series of some three or four messages on the home. And today will be message number one has to do with the marriage part of it. Now, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, will you please? Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read some scripture that has to do with the marriage uniting together of husband and wife. I'm not setting myself up as an authority on the home, God forbid. I'm not setting myself up as having a perfect home. I don't know anybody that does have a perfect home. I'm sure that any home today that while well, you're listening or here in this auditorium, there's some improvements you could have by making your home. And you'll do that as long as you have a home. You can always find some way and somehow to improve it. As I bring the word of God to you, remember that the Bible speaks to all of our hearts. I never intend in any of my preaching to set myself up as being perfect and point my finger at you and say you're not perfect, which I know none of us are, are perfect, no doubt about that. But any time that a man or a teacher, a preacher, preaches the word of God, then it's a two-edged sword. It cuts in two directions. And many times he's cut with the word of God by the scriptures. At the same time, the audience as well. No doubt in this series of messages I'll be bringing on the home, there'll be some of you that may be angry at me, may get mad and say, I don't appreciate what the preacher said. But if it's the word of God backed up by common sense and the scriptures, you better listen to what God has to say about it, whether you agree or not. That's a matter between you and God. It's my responsibility to preach it, and it's your responsibility to heed it and do what God said in the blessed book. Now, you write to me if you want this tape. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is zip code number. My mail, my radio support has been off for the past few weeks. It's been a struggle. Many of you love God and appreciate this whole mission work and know the value of it. And you'd like for it to continue on to the glory of God, so would I. But you must remember, we work us together in getting out the gospel. I can't do it alone. We have to have each other in taking care of God's work and the expense of God's work. And so you pray for me and God moves upon your heart to stand by this home mission work. God keeps the record and I know I would appreciate it. And remember that mailing address is post office box 501. The name is Virgil Edwards, zip code is 30603, the city is Athens, and the state is Georgia, of course. Ephesians chapter 5, now Paul in writing to the church at Ephesus emphasizes the fact that families should have a spirit-filled life of family. Families should be a spirit-filled, and in verse 18 it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit. God commands the request that we be filled with the Spirit. And then the words I read that shall follow, 
is the result of a spirit-filled life of family. Now, in order to have a home of this type that act according to the Word of God, we must maintain a spirit-filled life. Now, when you feel with God's Spirit in verse 19, it says, speaking to yourselves in Psalms. Now, you know what the Psalms are. They're written by David and others. They used to sing those Psalms back in those days, and some churches do now. They sing the Psalms. And then speaking to yourselves in Psalms, quote those Psalms, sing them, think on them, meditate on them. And then in hymns. Now this morning you heard the choir singing from the hymnal. They were singing the hymns. And then when the quartet came to sing, they sing a spiritual song. It says songs, singing in hymns and songs and spiritual songs. So you have the Psalms, you have the hymns, you have the spiritual songs, they're all biblical. And then making melody in your heart to the Lord. You're lifted by God's Spirit. And maybe you want to patch your foot or say praise the Lord and make melody in your heart or however you feel like doing it. And so he says when we're filled with the Spirit, then of course these things should be in our hearts and minds. And then he goes on, continuing on, talking about the spirit-filled marriage and home and so forth. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Talking about husbands and wives, as we'll see. Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as... Now it says, why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now this lip movement today... Uh, it's not of God. You have that started by people that know nothing about the word of God and the Lord. I, yeah, I call it lip movement because that's most of what it is. You might call it liberation or whatever you want to. Why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife. Now that's what God said. That's the book. I, I didn't write the Bible. I'm telling you what God said in the Bible. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with washing water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nursed and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let everyone in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now and today and the few Sundays to come, the Lord willing, we'll be expatiating upon these verses, finding out all we can about them, plumbed our hearts and lives and homes. But I'm going to deal primarily today with the marriage factor of the home. Now the strength of a nation stems from the home. If you don't have good homes, you're not going to have a strong nation. If you don't have good men and women coming out of homes, you're not going to have a good strong leadership in Washington. That's why today they're always up there tracing one another around and fighting fault with each other and casting each other out and sending one another to prison and so forth is because many of them did not come out of good homes. Our forefathers that went to Washington, great men, 
men of integrity, men with principle, men with character. Those great men founded this nation for many years. They operated and built a great nation. And I'm sorry to say today you have men in every field, every profession that's not come out of good, solid, biblical homes and they're causing trouble in what profession they're in, whether it be in politics or whatnot. Now we know that marriage is ordained of God, but I'm sorry to say today that about one out of every two marriages today end up in divorce. Now do you think God is in that? Absolutely not. Many marriages today, God has nothing whatsoever to do with it. Now whenever you have a biblical marriage, you have a joining together and becoming of one, a man and woman. That's when God joins people together. Now today they're trying to glorify women bearing children without a husband. Now they're promoting that and trying to glorify that. And a lot of stupid women want children without a husband and try their best in order to have a child without a husband. And they're trying to glorify that in the land today. And that helps to corrupt the land. That little child comes up. With no father to help take care of it. And that silly woman, she thinks she can have a child and be glorified in doing so without a husband. That's bad. In one of the foreign nations, one small nation, week before last, they announced that now the queers can marry one another. Two men can marry one another. Two Lisbons, Lisbons can marry one another and uh, they can adopt children. Now, can you imagine a home with little children being adopted into it with two shaggy-headed queers, two men trying to raise those youngs? What kind of home would you have there? What kind of training would you have for those children? It should be outlawed and never permitted for two queers to get together and adopt a child. That's stupid and stupid indeed. Helps to bring the wrath of God upon a nation. But this particular nation has let down that standard and said that's all right. And you may face the same thing here in America sometime pretty soon. Because the homosexuals trying to move toward the front and have recognition and glorify themselves and call themselves gays. And there's nothing gay about them. You look at one of them you can tell there's nothing gay about that crowd. Much deceived men, sex perverts, uh, sodomites that God destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. Nothing gay about them. They're just wearing a good name. That's all. You have a lot of ladies today. Their names are gay. And, uh, and then when that outfit adopted that title, it just absolutely embarrassed sometimes a person with that name. And you walk into their place today and somebody walk in and say, uh, How are you gay? And people look around and wonder if it was a homosexual or a woman. And it's a little embarrassing. No reflection on people that carry that name. I have a daughter named Gaydale and she goes by the name of Gay. Most people call her Gay for short. A lot of other good women have the same name. And that bunch of queers have adopted that title of that name whenever they they are not gay at all you must remember that now the bible says in genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 the lord god said it's not good that man should be alone i'll make a helpmate for him one day god created began to create animals he created a man and uh, created animals and a man and that man's name was adam and then he said, Adam, I want you to name these animals. So he began to name them, a horse, a cow, a dog, what not. He named the animals. God said, that's good. And, but God said, now you don't have a helpmate. I'm not going to uh, marry you to one of these animals. You need a helpmate. You need somebody that can be part of you. And the Bible tells us then that God put Adam to sleep. And perform surgery upon Adam. That's the first place in the Bible. Where you find a person being put to sleep for surgery. God put Adam to sleep. And then God began to operate on him. 
God took out of his sight a rib. And then from that rib, God made a woman. And he said, Adam, this is part of you. I want you to name this woman. And, and then Adam said, we'll name her Eve because the name Eve means the mother of all living. And so Adam had a companion and they were one. Now when God marries a couple, when they're married to the Lord and have a biblical marriage, they become one individual. They are one. Your wife is part of you. Your husband is part of you. And you need to realize that. Now, all this marriage and divorcing today, God's got nothing to do with it. Divorcing, remarrying, all that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a biblical ground for a divorce and remarriage. I'm not going to get into that now. But about a 90% of all the divorces today, God has nothing to do with it. About 90% of all the remarriages today, God has nothing to do with it. It's just something that man does that God has no part of. But when God married a couple, they become one. Now, I heard a preacher say some time ago when he was preaching, and this makes pretty good sense. May sound silly to you. He said, we have some children in our home. But he said, my wife is first. And that's where it should be. If you have children, you and your husband, then your husband or your wife is first, your children second. Now you let that sink deep down into your ears because the husband is part of you and the wife is part of the husband and the children come in, part of both of you. And together you should rear those children, but that wife comes before those children. That husband comes before those children. If they're not in that order in your home, your home is out of order. This man said, uh, this preacher said, nobody sits between me and my wife when we sit down at the table. Said, my wife sits beside of me. My children don't get in between me and my wife. Nobody sits between me and my wife in our home, at the table, or in our automobile. Said, when we get in the automobile, my, my children don't get between me and my wife. No, sir. She sits next to me and then comes the children. He said, everything we do, our wife comes first or the husband comes first and then the children have their part. Now you let that sink in and that makes pretty good sense. You have a lot of homes today. The wives make so much over their children, they ignore the poor old husband. He's like one of the old dogs around the house, you know. You throw him a cold biscuit once in a while. But your main concern is about those children. That's where your heart is. A lot of times it's that way with a husband. Well, the, uh, they just absolutely know the wife and all the heart goes to the children. And that's where the heart is. Now, you're to love your children. Don't misunderstand. If you don't love them, you're not right. I don't care who you are. But that wife comes first in your life. Now you remember, she's part of you. She's taken, God took a rib from Adam and made Eve, and they become one together. When you get married, you become just one. If your wife is hurt, you're hurt. If your husband is hurt, then you're hurt. If you suffer, the wife suffers, the husband suffers, and vice versa. Remember, you are one and the children are part of both of you. And that's God's divine order. That's why it's so pitiful when husbands and wives get in a fuss and separate and decide they want to divorce and run and grab somebody else and bust up a few homes and leave a few children with one parent, leave them without a dad, without a mother. And that's tragic. That's one reason you have so much corruption and sin and rebellion and ungodliness in the land today is because you have children coming up in a home where there's only one parent. There are women today in the land that having illegitimate children just in order to get more welfare. They don't give a rip whether or not the child has a dad or not. And those children grow up in a home of rebellion and disobedience and when they grow up, they do the same thing and they go out and they commit crime and rob and steal. Every family where there's children need both mother and dad. Now you need to realize that. 
Now there may come a time when one member of the family becomes so ungodly and so mean and cruel until you have to uh, separate or do something about that, but it should not be that way. They should be in harmony and rein the children because they both need it. Now who does most of the suffering whenever the separation and remarriage come? Who does most of the suffering? The children. The little children has to do most of the suffering. They love their mother, they love their daddy, and now they're separated without one of them, and their little hearts are torn asunder, and they're not going to be brought up in a home with one parent like they would have if both parents had been there and been doing right. And the little fellow suffered and grew up in that condition, and it tears their little hearts out. Now, who is God going to hold responsible for that? The husband and wife that brought it about. They go and answer God for it the day of judgment. Now God created Adam and then he gave him Eve and Adam said, um, Adam said, Madam, this is Adam. And there they were. They started their home. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4, Marriage is all in all and the bit on the fire but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 and you need to get this now. Let me have your ears. Keep your feet on the floor and give me your ears a minute. The Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What is God trying to tell us here? God is telling us that a Christian person should never marry an unsaved individual. Occasionally we have some thief will come into our church and he's looking for a fine Christian girl and he wants a virgin, he wants a fine young clean girl that's lived a good clean life. Maybe he's lived like the devil out there in the world, but he knows the best place in the world to find a good girl is at church, a good fundamental Bible-believing church, and he starts dropping in. Now what is he looking for? He's trying to find him a good girl in that church and he'll hang around and, like a thief until he can steal her and take her away. And then when he marries her, he's unsaved and she's saved. And maybe she thought, I'll just win him to God. I love him so much. I could almost swallow him whole. And then a few years later, she wished to God she had to swallow him whole. But anyway, they, uh, she says, maybe I'll marry him and I'll straighten him out. Nine times out of ten, she doesn't straighten him out. He gets her out. Do you see her back in the house of God? No. She may come occasionally, but and then she'll eventually drop out altogether. And that's exactly what I'm taking a stand against today, and parents ought to do likewise. When that boy is a thief at heart to come in and steal out of a good family, or out of the church, a fine, beautiful, lovely young girl, and then he has in mind getting her out of the church, and then he dominates her, of course, and she doesn't get back to the house of God, and, and she yielded that temptation, and she did wrong when she married him. She never wanted him to God. Now she's living with a man that's on the road to hell, and she's on the road to heaven. Then eventually the children come along, and many of them are going to follow him to hell, and some few may follow her to heaven. You have a divided situation. The Bible says for believers not to be married to unbelievers. Let the sinners marry one another, but let the saved people be yoked together by God and marry each other as believers, as true saved people, and God joins you together. All of this of uh, getting marriage license today and abiding by the law of the state and calling yourself married, God didn't join you together. God didn't marry you. You just went ahead and abided by the law of the state and you say we are married and I guess so. Uh, you probably are inside of the, the state, but God didn't join you together. Many times that's the case. Now, if you're saved, don't marry an unsaved person. I've seen too much of that. I've seen too many of our young girls being taken out by unsaved boys and their lives are hell on earth today. You parents ought to see to that. When somebody comes in trying to get your daughter, 
and she attends church and she loves God, you better be sure that he loves God. If not, when he takes her away, that'll be about the end of her church life. And that's pathetic. Now, if you go marry an unbeliever, if you go marry an unsaved man, the Bible says the devil is the father of the unsaved. And you're a Christian, you go marry an unsaved man, who's your father-in-law? The devil. The Bible said the devil's his father. I know he has an earthly father, but the devil's his father also. And you have the devil for a father-in-law. I'm not talking about his, his natural father, earthly father. I'm telling you what God said. And so when you marry the devil's youngins, then you pause, pawn law is the devil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, the Bible says a Christian person is only to marry in the Lord. Now, if you have a godly companion and your companion dies, you have a perfect right to get married again, but only in the Lord. You have no scriptural grounds, no right to marry an unsaved person. God said don't do it. Many widows and widowers, they lose their companions. They want to get married again. But if you do, nothing wrong in that. You better be sure you marry a saved person. If you don't, you're headed for trouble. And it's good to marry fairly young. You don't have to wait until you get a walking stick to go down the aisle with to get married. A, a pair of crutches. You, you need to marry fairly young. In biblical days... They'd get up around 40 years old and then there's time to get married. Today you have a lot of people marrying too young. And don't wait until you're dead with old age because it's far better to smell evening in Paris than near Sloan's liniment. And so if you wait until they come in on crutches, you liable to have to endure Sloan's liniment or Watkins liniment instead of that good perfume you find on the young ladies. And you need to keep that in mind. Marry fairly young. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 5 verse 18. Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Now let me drop this bombshell right here. And you give it some thought. It is said and proven that if a person. Waited until he's 28 years old to marry. He or she. They would never, never marry the person. They would marry at the age of 17. If they married that person at the age of 17, then changed it off at a little bit 28, they would not have married that person. Now, just you just think about it for, for, for this word. Oh, you say, preacher, did they all go? No, 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 misunderstand me. There's some good boys and girls married young and did fine. I'm talking about as a general rule. A lot of people marry young. I married when I was 19 years old. My wife is 19. I was grandfather at the age of 39. And uh, still 39. I'm not going to tell you how many years I've been 39. That's none of your business. But uh, I was grandfather at the age of 39. My wife and I met each other when we was about 15, 16 years old. Started dating each other. About three years, we were sweethearts. And then at the age of 19, we married. And we've been married ever since. When we got married, the man said to her, said, well, Wilt thou take this man to be thy lawfully wedded husband and she wilted and she's been wilting ever since and sometimes it happens like that but anyway marry fairly young and don't wait until you have to have those crutches to get down to the altar with you might not be able to kneel if you did and then of course um, be sure you have much in common so many young girls they grab the first one that comes along because they're afraid the second will never make it and they never consider whether they have anything in common or not. My wife and I is compatible. We were compatible from the time we married on this present hour. I don't guess there's a woman living as far as I know that could uh, fit in with me as far as I am. And uh, mean as I am, as hard to get along as I am, that like, like she could. And of course she wouldn't admit I'm that kind of a fella, but uh, I might be. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is be sure that you have things in common. That there's certain things you like together. You, certain things you do together. Certain things that you realize that you don't have to fuss about. Check out and see well, if you have things in common. Not only that, but a lot of young boys never think about this, or girls either. 
Whenever you're quoting that young man or young girl, you're thinking about holy matrimony, kind of take a peep over his shoulders and see what his mom and pa looks like. When you see what her mother looks like, you're going to pretty well know what she's going to look like when she gets that age. If you don't like the way she looked and she's a snag lightning, well, you've got one of probably snag lightning too whenever she gets that age. Young boy, young girl, you look over his shoulders and see what his paw looks like. And what his daddy looks like, he'll pretty well look pretty much like that when he gets that age. If you can't put up with that at that age, you better stay single. But you know a lot of people never think about that. You young people ought to look at that boy's family and his background and she ought to look at your family and background. I mean really scrutinize that outfit because... That's where your wife's coming from or where your husband's coming from. And pretty much what you see there is what you're going to see in him. And you need to look that over real good. Take a good peep at it. A lot of young people never think, but I want her. Oh, she's a doll. I, I, I'm going to marry I don't care what her parents look like, how they act, how many times been in the chain gang, or how many people he shot. I, don't, I just don't care. I, I, want, I, want that, I want that girl. She's pretty. You better take a good peep at her parents. I advise you to do that. Be sure you have much in common. And not only that, if you're not willing to settle down, you got no business getting married. Be sure you're willing to settle down. A lot of young people marry and settle down at an early age, and a lot of them never settle down. You need to settle down and realize that you have a home of your own and a wife of your own, a husband of your own, and be willing to settle down. A lot of people never settle down all the days of their life. And you need to realize that. There's a woman one time getting married. And I think this is your black woman. And the preacher said to you, to her, said, Are you willing to take this uh, man for the better and for the worse? She said, Well, I know he won't get any better and I... Don't see I could get any worse. I think I just take him like he is. And you better realize what you're taking when you're taking him. Man got married one time and said uh, he took his wife for the better and he took her for the worse. And then she turned around after a few years and took him for everything he had. And a lot of people wound up in that today. They take their wife for the better and for the worse and turns out for the worse and she turns around and takes everything he's got and puts him on the street. Now that's bad, isn't it? These things need to be thought about and weighed out and considered before it ever happens. And then be sure it's true love. Now if it's not true love, then of course you need to be slow about getting married. If there's any question about it, don't get married. Wait until that's clear in your mind. Those Israelites never moved until that cloud moved by day and the fire by night, and they moved. If there's a doubt in your mind as well not you ought to marry that person, you stop right there, and you drive up a stake, and don't you move. That doubt is clear. If it never clears, don't you marry that person. You be sure that doubt is out of your mind, and everything is clear as a bell, and then you can move forward. A lot of people run into this marriage situation today and don't realize, don't give it a thought, don't consider the cost, don't consider whether or not they would be compatible, don't consider uh, just anything of the future. They, I just like, she's just a doll and I got to have her. I got to have her. Never think about anything else. A lot of girls are the same way. They say, well, now this is my first shot at a man, first chance I've had of getting married. I, I'm going to marry. I'm not going to wait because if I don't marry him, then nobody else may come along. Now you wait a minute. I want you to listen to this Baptist preacher. If you're a Christian boy or a Christian girl, I believe with all of my heart that if you commit your companion to be to God, if you get out on your knees and say, Lord, Lord, I want you to lead me to the right person. Lead me to the right person, Lord. Both the girl and the boy should do that. Of course, a lot of girls, they, you, they pray, God, I want you to give my mother a son-in-law like 
uh, my neighbor has over there. She has a son-in-law, and I think my mother ought to have a son-in-law. You need to be careful about the kind of son-in-law you get for your mother, see? If you get your mother or son-in-law that don't fit, then you part of the blame. Like the woman up shouting one time, up and down in front of the church, and she said, praise God, I'm so happy and full of the Holy Spirit, bless the Lord. And I want you to know, preaching, I want this church to know, I love everybody. About that time, a son-in-law walked in the door, and she said, almost everybody. Now, so just be sure that you love the person right, and that love should be of God. Now, I see my time is run out today. The Lord willing, I'll take up next Sunday morning here and continue on. This is tape number 320, and I'm talking about the marriage in the home today. We'll continue with the series till next Sunday, the good Lord willing. Appreciate the way you've listened. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray in Jesus' name that the Spirit of God will take over this message and convey it to hearts and penetrate souls. May the message help every one of us. Lord God, we all need the Word of God, and I pray that the message will find a lodging place in every heart here today. In the precious, lovely name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Debbie, you play a number for us, and as Debbie plays, I don't know, God may have spoken to your heart. And if God has spoken to your heart and you need to come to this altar, you come right ahead. Because I've given you the message up to you now to respond to it. God is speaking to you, obey God. If you need to get saved, come back to God, join the church or what not. Then you come. It's all right, Debbie. Uh, let me clear, say this to you. I don't want to have anybody leave here grieved today. If you're here and you've been divorced and you're remarried, you may say, preach, what must I do? I divorced and I've remarried. Well, nothing to do but ask God to help you, forgive you, and don't go and do the best you can. Go and live with your companion that you're married to and do the best you can. <laughs> God don't say, leave her and run back to the first one. No, you stay with the one you're with. And whatever damage is done, you'll face that at the judgment. It may come out in your children, your grandchildren, but you can do nothing but go on and make the best.